And that's just a collapse initiation sequence. They don't really describe the actual dynamics of the buildings falling. They actually just say global collapse ensued. And that way they can ignore a whole lot of evidence that points to al an alternative hypothesis, like explosions uh, uh, from witnesses witnessing explosions or hearing it, demolition squibs coming off the buildings, the speed of collapse, which is a very important piece of evidence. They can ignore all of that by just saying global collapse ensues, you know, period. The biggest problems with that story are the fireproofing being lost, um, and I show in my lecture that the uh, tests that were done, very weak and humble tests done by NIST, proved that actually the fireproofing could not have been lost on the, in the buildings. There was no energy for it. There was no mechanism for it to occur. That's probably the biggest problem is the idea that the external columns would bow inward, which is primary to the official story. There is absolutely no physical testing to support that. There is no intuitive reasoning behind it. Furthermore, in their NIST report, as you read carefully, they only take you to the point where the uh, towers are poised, each tower is poised to collapse. That's their term, poised to collapse. They don't look at what happens after it starts moving. So now then what does NIST do? They go to a computer simulation, which is not as good as an experiment, you got to admit, right? Because this is now a computer model trying to get it's an explanation for the buildings to, to fail. You know, when they got to the warping, instead of three inches, which is what the experiment showed, 42 inches, that's over three feet of warping. <laughs> now, that's a big difference. So you do the experiment, you get three inches, like that, and you, you do your computer model and you stick in there 42 inches. <laughs> I mean, what, you see what I'm saying? And the only support is from a highly manipulated computer model in which, you know, the temperatures were exaggerated, the fire times were exaggerated, all the fireproofing was stripped off, and the floors were disconnected so that we've got absolutely no actual uh, conceptual uh, framework in which to see columns being pulled inward. If the floors are disconnected, there's no force to pull the columns inward. How did it happen? We're talking about a phantom force now in a highly manipulated computer model. And that's what we're basing our future on and all of these changes we're seeing. So they had test results that disproved what they were saying that happened. Um, there were also comments being made still about jet fuel fires and melting steel uh, by experts supporting the official story. So I wrote to NIST and I asked them about their report and I asked them to please clarify the ideas that are being stated in the media and in the report. And uh, I was fired for writing the letter. I was fired for nothing else but writing this letter. I didn't violate any policies. I had been promoted just earlier that year to the top management position in my division. They gave me a letter of termination. They said that the, the relationship with NISD was harmed, that it was poor judgment. I was in the front page of my local newspaper who also interviewed UL. And they asked UL, well, is this guy, was this guy saying true? Did you test or certify this steel? And they said, well, there's no evidence that we tested this steel. They didn't say they didn't do it or their CEO was wrong. They said there was no evidence for it. Okay, that's a problem. NIST is also under non-disclosure agreement. That's in their report. In other words, they can't say too much. So someone above them is putting these constraints on these guys. We offered to sit down with the guys at NIST or debate them, you know, sit down, whatever, talk to them about our concerns. They declined. We, we had uh, mentioned a specific time and place. And so we said, well, look, you name the time and place. We, we just think we ought to talk about these problems. I mean, this affects the whole world, really. Um, you know, the weaknesses in your analysis. And um, I guess I wasn't too surprised. They said, a change in venue and a change in time will not affect, will not change our decision. We're not going to sit down and talk. I'm Jim Nesh. I've been in the foundry business for approximately 28 years. My expertise is I pour metal. I have a gas-fired furnace. It uh, run 750,000 BTUs and I pour 
all non-ferrous metals, brass, bronze, aluminum. It takes me approximately, in a controlled environment inside the furnace, 45 to 55 minutes to melt brass, which is poured at 1950 to 2000 degrees. Uh, bronze is higher temperature, but I can go to like 2350. I do not pour steel because it's too hot. The crematories are above, like say 2500 degrees, that people are disintegrated. That if there were people in that building, how did they peek out and look or jump? How are they not melted immediately if they have a heat that intense? to warp or mess with the structure of steel, how are the people still alive? It's, it's impossible. To weaken something 50 feet away would have melted you to be in this vicinity. Logically, uh, physically, uh, no way could have caused a collapse in any way. It could not have affected uh, the collapse of the World Trade Center. It's impossible. After you let the buildings come down, you have to explain this flowing material right at the corner, by the way, which is on the uh, north face of the south tower. But right there at that corner, this molten metal with the orange glow, flow, the old yellow orange glow flows out for minutes. There's a lot of it. And then right at that corner, you see this weakening, the twisting and the collapse of the building. NIST tries to explain that molten metal, which is yellow orange color, a lot of material flowing out. They said, well, it's aluminum. That's what they said early on. And then I did experiments with aluminum and it's silver. So they came back and said, well, aluminum with, you know, wood, chips, plastic, carpet, stuff mixed in. But that, they said, can have an orange glow. Well, the can caught my attention. The next, I, I immediately was out doing experiments, you know. Molten aluminum, we put in some wood chips and plastic, wood ash from my wood-burning stove and carpet pieces and glass. I mean, we're just putting all this stuff in there, melt this stuff up. And uh, we have a young uh, professor here who came from NIST. He couldn't believe that NIST would say, you know, if you mix organics with aluminum it'll, it, and pour it out, now it'll have an orange glow. He couldn't believe they'd be wrong. But we couldn't get it. So he was working with me for over an hour. Mixing, mixing, mixing this <laughs> concoction of molten aluminum with wood, glass, plastic, carpet pieces. Mix, mix, mix. And you know, it doesn't want to mix, the, that is, the organics don't want to mix with the molten aluminum. We just poured it out. He poured it out, actually. Silvery, not orange glow, no orange glow. I melt aluminum. Aluminum is white colored, silver colored. Uh, there is no different colors in it. That's the only color it can be because it's silver colored. To have a different color in there means another chemical has to be involved. There was no melting of any structures below whatever story it was on down. So if something fell, it's going to just land there and stay there. It's, the building's not going to fall down. On July 28, 1945, the Empire State Building was struck by a bomber on its way to Newark Airport. It left a hole 18 feet wide and 20 feet high, but the building did not collapse. It was for this reason that the World Trade Towers were built to sustain impacts from several jet airliners. The building was designed to have a fully loaded 707 crash into it. That was the largest plane at the time. I believe that the building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners because this structure is like the mosquito netting on your screen door, this intense grid. And the jet plane is just a pencil puncturing that screen netting. It really does nothing to the screen netting. Frank A. Martini died in the 9-11 attacks. Lee Robertson, the WTC project structural engineer, also confirmed that the towers were designed to take hits from jet aircraft. Well, the columns and core were, this was a self-standing core. It was the first thing that went up and the rest of the building was built around it. 47, these are huge columns, 47 of them, and they held the elevator shafts and, and some uh, service floors and so forth. Um, this was regular construction grade steel, A36 it's called, uh, which means it has 36,000 PSI of yield strength or greater. And so it's typical construction steel, but it's very huge columns. Uh, around the outside of the building was 
were uh, 236 columns that were box columns made of uh, very high grade.